this was your dad's favorite book. And I have to tell you, I don't remember the book. But I do remember that I've been in love with frogs for as long as I can remember. And I've been trying to answer this question, what is a frog, for as long as I can remember. And that question and that love started right here. This is a house not far from here. This is my grandmother's house, plywood tin roof house. My grandmother's grandfather built that house. My grandmother was born in that house. My mother was born in that house. And when my grandmother died, she was still living in that house. And when we cleaned out that house, she still had the bill of sale for her grandmother in that house from when her grandfather bought her freedom and the house and moved in there. Incredible amount of history, incredible amount of who I am was in that house. What's more is we used to spend the weekends when I was a kid at my grandmother's house, and behind this house was a huge forest. And I remember being lost in that forest for hours and hours, chasing snakes and filming birds on that little, whatever it was called, 16 millimeter films. And I can now share with you, compliments of Google Earth, that forest. <laughs> that was it. There's the house. It was this tiny, I don't know if you can see that. It was this tiny little thing. The graveyard was always there. The horse pasture and the highways were always there. But when I was a kid, it seemed like the Amazon. I remember it just being vast and being lost there for hours. And it was literally just this tiny little, I doubt it's 100 feet across, this tiny little plot. But it had an incredible impact on me. It was the place where I was introduced to these guys. And I'll tell you a funny story about frogs. They, unlike many other animals, they're very altruistic. For example, the frog on the top there has hurt its leg. And the one on the bottom is nice enough to give it a ride home. You know, <laughs> you know I, told that, I told that joke in New York and nobody laughed. I wonder about the people in New York. <laughs> At any rate, I could tell you another story, but the punchline is probably not appropriate. But it ends something like, see what happens when you help a friend. Because what happens in these wood frogs is that they lay their eggs in these big communal clumps. So these little spheres you see, and this is an odd thing to have multiple screens for me, but these little spheres... Each one of those is a single female's clutch of eggs, about a thousand eggs. But hundreds of females might lay their eggs in these huge communal clumps. And what I became interested in, in looking at this particular species, is how this behavior interacted with ecology and development. In the sense that the eggs in the middle for this species, because of the insulating effect of the eggs around, the eggs in the middle can be as much as 10 degrees warmer than the eggs on the edge. That means that if you're the first frog to get there and lay your eggs in the center, your eggs will develop faster. They will grow faster. They'll metamorphose faster. And I was particularly interested in, and I should warn you, you're going to see a lot of gonads today. Probably more gonads than you'll ever see in your life. But what I was interested in, and maybe I could use the pointer here, what I became interested in is how temperature might affect the sex ratio of the offspring. Because in some fish and reptiles, and potentially some amphibians, temperature can affect whether or not you become a male so these are testes here, or female. These are ovaries. And I did these experiments where I was interested in how temperature would influence the sex ratio of, of animals. And then I was also interested in the interaction between genes and the environment. So what boundaries might the genes put on the ability of the environment to influence sex ratio? So I looked for sex chromosomes a, in this study as well. Now, I'm going to tell you the story in chronological order. So I want you to know where I am. We started from a little boy who likes frogs at his grandmom's house. This work is work from my work at Harvard, where I did my undergraduate thesis. And this is, if you're wondering why the slides look so crappy, this is back before Adobe Photoshop existed, young people. In 1989, this is back when cut and paste literally meant cut and paste. You had to cut it out and paste it on the page. That's where that function comes from in Adobe Photoshop. This is work that I did. Some of you guys were talking about an REU program. This is work that I did for my NSF REU when I was an undergraduate in 1986. There's my professor, Bruce Waldman, who took me in and treated me like a graduate student. I worked with him for four years. There I am at age 19. There's Laura, who I guess went on to do something else because she doesn't look quite as excited as I was <laughs> to be in a swamp at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. But it was like a dream come true for me. The other thing that was a dream for me as a child, I dreamed of going to Africa. I remember distinctly my father, who laid carpet, brought home Someone had given him a big box of National Geographic magazines. And I remember folding out the maps of these National Geographic magazines. And I remember dreaming of going to this magical, magical place. And it was truly a dream come true. My father made $9,000 a year when I was a kid 
The first time I ever got on an airplane was when I went off to college, when I went to Harvard. So it was out of the realm of possibility for me as a kid. But as a graduate student, I not only got to go to Africa, I got to grow this weird beard, <laughs> but I not only got to go to Africa, but National Geographic paid for it. I got to be in the magazine, I got to be on the show, I got to be in a Toyota commercial. <laughs> this was literally a dream come true for me. I literally got to become that guy that I watched on television as a kid. And I went to Africa, I went to Kenya, and I went to work in a place called the Arabuku Sukoke. It's just on the coast in Kenya, in Eastern Africa. And one of the cool things about working in Africa is you get to say words like Arabuku Sukoke. How many people have ever gotten to say Arabuku Sukoke? I don't even know what it means, but I worked in the Arabuku Sukoke forest, and I discovered, I went there to work on something else, but I discovered this species, Hyperolis argus. And what fascinated me, what fascinates a little boy about a species like this, is that the males and females look completely different. Birds look different, right? Males and females. But birds look at each other when they choose their mates. Frogs are breeding at night. They listen. So I became curious, why do these frogs look different? What, what, what is the selection that has caused these animals to evolve such different coloration? I also became interested in how they get to be differently colored. So we brought some back. And just so you know where we are in the story now, I'm a graduate student just becoming a new assistant professor. And in fact, my first trip to Africa, I was with Mary Mendonza, some of us were just talking about, who worked at SREL, which some of us were just talking about. And we brought these animals back. And, and by the way, you can tell we had Adobe Photoshop then, because see, now this cut and paste looks a lot nicer. This is the same individual frog, photographed once a day for six days. And we discovered that the males and females both start out green. And the females change color, like I showed you, at sexual maturity, at puberty. And so we hypothesized that estrogen regulated this color change. So in the same way that if you're a human, when you reach puberty as a girl, estrogen causes your breasts to grow, we hypothesized that in this case, estrogen causes this frog to change color. And then we did some very simple tests. Sometimes the, sometimes the experiment is simple. Sometimes you don't need anything fancy. We just dip the frogs in hormone. So if you dip them in testosterone, nothing happens. But if you dip them in estrogen, which in six, within six days, they'll change color. Now things get weird. And they got weird, in case you weren't wondering when it got weird. It got weird for me on February 15th, 1993. And I remember the date clearly because it's the day before my son was born. And I'm at University of California, Davis. And I'm giving a talk on my color-changing frog, Hyperolis argus. And my wife goes into labor while I'm giving my talk. So we're driving down the highway. It's a 100% true story. I don't make this stuff up. So we're driving down the highway to go back to Oakland, Berkeley, where my son was born. And my wife, between contractions, says, you should patent that frog. I said, what do you mean you can't patent a frog? She calls her brother. And he says, oh, yeah, you can't patent a frog. Here to Ford be referred. He's a lawyer. And we called it the Hyperolis Argus endocrine screen, or the test. And that's where things get weird. This is the juncture where a little boy who likes frogs gets introduced to grown-up words. And for some reason, grown-up words come in twos. I don't know why. They just do. I'll give you a few examples. In this case, the grown-up word that I was introduced to was intellectual property. <laughs> you see, I thought the idea was mine. But the university says, no, it's our idea. I I'm not sure. They didn't go to Africa. They didn't collect the frogs. They didn't dip them in the hormones. But somehow, it was their intellectual property. And so the university says, well, if you don't find a way to make money on it, we're going to sell it. So they were going to sell my frog. So my wife and I filed the patent. My wife had an MBA and an MPH. And here's why you patent the frog. First off, they all start out green, like I told you. The controls are green, the unexposed ones. But if you give these frogs, and we screen dozens of compounds, if you give these frogs estradiol, estradiol is the estrogen that's in the natural estrogen that's in everybody. Exact same chemical, it doesn't matter if you're a frog, a dog, a cat, a hog, or a human. If you're a sexually mature female, this hormone circulates in your blood. Makes my frog change color. If you give them ethanyl estradiol, the synthetic estrogen is used in birth control pill, they'll change color. If you give them DES, a very potent pharmaceutical estrogen, they'll change color. If you give them DDT, which is an insecticide that happens to bind the estrogen receptor, they'll change color. So we screened dozens of compounds, and we discovered Every estrogen that made my frog change color was also known to promote breast cancer. So we had a little frog from Africa that we could raise by the tens of thousands, and we could screen compounds and figure out if they would promote breast cancer. You could send me some of your drinking water. I put my frog in it, it changed the color. It's like, oh, you might not want to drink that water. 
What's more is we discovered that if you give these frogs tamoxifen, we can block their color change. And tamoxifen was the estrogen blocker used to treat breast cancer. So not only could we screen compounds and water to figure out if it might cause breast cancer, we could screen chemicals, pharmaceuticals that might be used to treat breast cancer. So that's why you patent a little frog that changes color. So we had to get, according to the university, we had to make some money on it. So our first customer was this little company called Novartis, and I'm being obnoxious, the largest chemical company in the world said, we want you to test atrazine. I had no idea what atrazine was. It's an S-chlorotriazine, if you're interested in the chemistry. And it's amazing how much chemistry I have to do. Your chancellor's a chemist. It's amazing to me how much chemistry I have to do. I hated chemistry. <laughs> in fact, chemistry almost got me kicked out of college. It was so nice, I had to take it twice. And I'm not joking. I didn't fail, though, because Harvard doesn't give Fs. They give A, B, C, D, E. I'm going to let you guess which letter I got the first time. But at any rate... Atrazine is an herbicide. It's a weed killer, mostly used on corn. It's been used since 1958, so that's old than me. We use 80 million pounds a year. At the time, it was the number one selling agrochemical for the largest chemical company in the world. So this is a big deal. It's used in more than 80 countries, but it's now outlawed in all of Europe. Now, let me give you a disclaimer. This slide is a lie. The company's lawyer, among other things, likes to write me letters and say, this is not true. It has not been outlawed in Europe. They say, it has been denied regulatory approval by the European Union. <laughs> now, I don't know what the difference is. All I know is that this statement pisses them off. So that's the slide that I used, because that's just the kind of brother I am. <laughs> At any rate, they asked us to use another African frog, the African clawed frog, Xenopus labus. Who knows about the African clawed frog? You know about it because everybody is the most common frog used in developmental biology, but it's used for a weird reason. Not because it's representative of other frogs. It's used for the following reason. And I'm going to tell you the story for three reasons. I have a rule. If I show you a slide, I have to be able to tell you three things about it. Otherwise, it's not important enough to show you. It's used because some guy discovered in 1920, this is a 100% true story, some guy discovered in 1920 that the human pregnancy hormone, HCG, will make this frog lay eggs. So by 1940, look it up. I'm not making this up. By 1940, this frog was the pregnancy test. If you thought you were pregnant, you would go to the doctor. They would inject some urine into the frog. And if it laid eggs, you were either happy or sad, depending on your situation. <laughs> Here are the three reasons I tell you the story. Number one, it shows you the value. And maybe you don't need to be convinced, but it shows you the value of curiosity-based research. Right? Who's the first guy who said, hey, you know, I wonder what will happen if I inject pee into a frog. Like, how do you discover that? Like, where does that even come from? I don't know. But it shows you. It was, a, it was a valuable discovery. The second reason I tell you that is it shows you the similarities between our hormones and frog hormones. In the same way that the estrogens that make my frog change color will also promote breast cancer, the human pregnancy hormone, HCG, that's responsible for all of you and your offspring, should you decide to have them, is so similar to this frog's hormones that it'll make it lay eggs. So as they tell you what atrazine does to this frog's hormones, you should be thinking, what might, frogs, or what might atrazine do to me? Thus, this is a tale of toads and men, and that's where we'll go. I guess the third reason I tell you this is when they figured out new pregnancy tests, you know, the plus you are, minus you are not, people just threw these frogs out, these African clawed frogs. So I can go to San Diego or I can go to San Francisco and collect African clawed frogs and not have to pay $50 a frog for some company, which technically, I guess, makes my frogs African-American clawed frogs. But that's a point that's <laughs> not relevant to the story. So we discovered while I was working for the company that atrazine inhibited the growth of the voice box of the larynx in these frogs. Now, that's bad news, because as some of you know, male frogs sing and females don't for the same reason that men have deeper voices than women, testosterone. So these data imply that atrazine, the number one selling product for the largest chemical company in the world, was somehow knocking down testosterone, not something you want to hear if you work for the company. If the problem is the testosterone, you go to the gonads. Like I told you, you're going to see a lot of go you're going to probably see more gonads today than you've ever seen in your life. If you look at the gonads of some of these exposed animals, so here are the kidneys. If you're not used to looking at frog gonads, they're inside. But here are the kidneys. And this is an animal that has testes, so it's a male. 
Oh, but wait, then it's got ovaries, then it's got another testis, then it's got more. This frog could hurt his leg and give itself a ride home. That's just out, and that's <laughs> not normal. And that's not a judgment. I say not normal, I get in trouble for using the word normal sometimes in some places that I, that I talk. By not normal, I mean that frogs are not naturally hermaphroditic. There are fish that are naturally hermaphroditic, but not frogs. Despite what you may have learned from reading or seeing Jurassic Park, frog DNA will not make you change sex, as the Jurassic Park claimed. So then we formulate a hypothesis, right? Because you, you get young guys all know you always have to have hypothesis. Here's our hypothesis. Imagine that this is your testicle. Or imagine this is somebody's testicle you don't like, because we're going to kind of mess around with it. If you have a testicle, you should make testosterone. Who, know, who knows what the word testosterone means? Who knows what the word portmanteau means? I'm 48 years old. I love words. I learn new words all the time. Portmanteau is like when you stick two words together. Like smoke and fog, you get smog. Twist and jerk, you get twerk. Testosterone is a portmanteau. It's testicular hormone. Testosterone is two words stuck together. It's the male hormone. Our hypothesis was that atrazine, and we had evidence for this, turns on an enzyme, a machinery, if you will, called aromatase. Remember aromatase. We're going to talk about it a lot. Aromatase converts testosterone into another portmanteau, estrogen. Estrogen means the generator of estrus. Two words stuck together. It's the female hormone. That's fine if you're a female, but if you're a male, that means you're demasculinized, your testosterone's being used up, and you're also feminized. Now you're making estrogen when you shouldn't. Now, we tested this. We measured blood levels of testosterone and control males, and these are daytime levels, so these are actually kind of low. But nevertheless, they're much higher than atrazine-treated males, which aren't very different from females. So we had the evidence that atrazine was acting as an endocrine disruptor. By now, the company's not talking to me. They're mad, they're mad, they're mad, they're mad. And here's also where we're at in my story. I'm now an assistant professor, literally about to come up for tenure. And I get these data, and I publish them in PNAS, Proceedings to the National Academy of Sciences, hermaphroditic, demasculized frogs after exposure to the herbicide atrazine at low ecological relevant doses. You guys know PNAS? It's a big deal. I'm coming up for tenure. I'm getting a paper published in PNAS. I call my mom. I call my mom every Sunday. I said, Mom, I have a paper coming out in PNAS. Silence. I think my mom's impressed. I said, did you hear me? I have a paper coming out in PNAS. My mom says, I heard you. I just don't understand how you get a paper cut on your penis. I said, no, no, P and She said, you don't have to spell it. I heard you. This is a 100% true story. My mom calls me up the next week, and she says, son, how important was that paper? I said, really important, Ma. She says, because I went to Barnes & Noble, and they never heard of that magazine. <laughs> There's a point to that story that I'll come back to in the end. But now this is my most important publication. It's a kid's book, and I didn't even write it, but my mom can get it in Barnes & Noble and see what it is her son's doing. I'll tell you why that's so incredibly important to me at the end of the talk. Oh, by the way, four black men and a Latina co-authored that paper. It's probably a record for PNAS, one of the other things that I'm very proud of. As important as it was, though, it didn't answer some important questions. One, we didn't know if these hermaphrodites were males with ovaries. Of hermaphrodite, by the way, is another portmanteau. Hermes and Aphrodite had a child that had the genitals of both male and female. That's the name Hermes, Aphrodite, hermaphrodite. But we didn't know if these hermaphrodites were Males with ovaries or females with testes because frogs don't have sex chromosomes. That's one of the things I discovered as an undergraduate. So we couldn't tell. We had a good idea because if you treat with atrazine, we might get 50% female, 30% male, 20% hermaphrodite. So we had a good idea it was males turning into females, but we didn't know. We also didn't know what happens when these animals become adults, which sounds like an easy question to answer, except that at the time it took us four to five years to raise these animals to adulthood. That means that, young people, I would have to get you as a freshman and say, hey, hey, you know, I... I have a project idea for you, and maybe by the time you graduate, we might have an answer. And in fact, it was worse than that. It took us like eight years to figure out, you know, to really get it together. But I had tenure. I was in no hurry. And the end result, after eight years, is we discovered this. They hurt their legs all the time. Here's another guy getting a ride. And by the time the, 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 we finished the experiment, a gene had been discovered, which I'm showing you here. So sometimes we do PCR and fancy stuff, right? But a gene DMW had been discovered that only females have. So we could prove, if you will, for example, that the guy on top who looks like he's smiling is a male. <laughs> his friend who's giving him a ride is actually his brother. So it turns out about 10% of the males completely turn into females as adults. For example, this guy, he, is now a grandmother. 
I'm sorry, actually, he is a great grandmother, completely female, lays eggs and everything, even though we know he's genetically a male that's been exposed to atrazine. That's kind of a big deal. I could have published that. But I had tenure. It was in no hurry. I wanted to know what happens to the 90% of the males that don't turn into females. Are they completely resistant and normal? Or are they impaired some way? I wanted to know whether or not these other males that were exposed to atrazine, the brothers of, of her, whether or not they could compete and reproduce. The problem is frogs reproduce in the spring. And as you young people may know, apparently, so do undergraduates. So they all want to go away for spring break, some pool party thing or something. So I have to convince these guys to stay and spend their spring break and their Easter with me and do some experiments. So I said, in 2008, how about spring break 2008? I give you a pool party. Snoop Dogg won't be there, but I'll give you a pool party and you'll potentially get a PNAS paper. How many young people would have done that? Spring break pool party and a PNAS paper. Okay. Okay, went something like this. This is 100% true. This is publishing PNAS. This is, this is our apparatus. So here's what we did. We literally, I just made this up. I said, let's put four females in there, four control males, four atrazine-treated males. And I know guys are thinking, that's not the sex ratio. You, I heard yesterday when I was driving in my rental car that Wednesday was wet t-shirt Wednesday. I didn't even know we still did that. So, but, and that's maybe not the sex ratio you want, but the idea is the females were limiting. The atrazine guys had to compete. So we literally... We, we did this five times. Everybody was a virgin. The males had never seen females before. It's match for size. Actually, we did it five times, but one morning a student kicked the pool and, and we couldn't get the results. But we got four, four episodes of results. And here's how it went. We put the animals in there at, at 7 p.m. Then the lights go out. We put on a little Marvin Gaye. You young people don't know anything about that. <laughs> and, and then we come back the next morning and, and we just look at who hooked up and who didn't. The young people know what I mean when I say hooked up. But what you can see is... There's stitches in there so we could tell who was who. These two guys lost out. So real simple stuff. And we did that. I didn't think it was going to work. But we did that, and we found out that the atrazine-treated animals almost never get the female. Only two atrazine-treated males ever got the female. Now, I'm an endocrinologist. That means I study hormones. So I can't just look at stuff. So imagine this. Here's how this went down. Imagine you're at the club. Last call. The lights come on. Somebody's walking around taking names about who's with who. And then they pull you apart, stick a needle in your heart, and take a blood sample. That's how this went down. Because we had to get the blood to measure the hormones. And if you do that, as you might guess, on average, the controls have more testosterone than the atrazine-treated males. But what's more important is you look at the individual animals, the blood levels, and who made the love connection, shown by the little hearts. The atrazine-treated males have very low testosterone. And at the time, we didn't know if the controls here had more testosterone because they got the female, or did they get the female because they had more testosterone. Turns out we now know that whether or not you get the female depends on your testosterone levels the night before you're in the pool. So what happens with these atrazine-treated males is their testosterone levels are knocked down so low that they don't stand a chance competing with these control males. So they always lose. Now, I could have published that, but as I told you, I had tenure. I was in no hurry. I like to go for the big shot. Next, I wanted to know, are these males, these atrazine-treated males, capable at all? So then we did what I call the Motel 6 experiments. In this case, I just got them a room so there's no competition. I put them together, let them have their night, see without competition, what will they do? And then we collected the eggs after this night, and that's what that looks like. And then we simply counted. So this is an unfertilized egg, this one, and the rest are developing. And then we just, it's a real complicated procedure. There's a student sitting there going, one, two, three. I think he went into math. And, and then we just calculated the fertility rate of the control males and the atrazine-treated males. If you do that, you find out that the control males will fertilize about 85% of a female's eggs, about 2,000 eggs per female, and the atrazine-treated females about, uh, treated males about 15%. Turns out for two reasons. One is they don't even try. They sit there and they watch the females. We now know, I won't have time to talk to you about it, and, and it's not published yet, that it's not only that they aren't interested in the females, it's not only that they're not competitive, they're actually more interested in other males. So now we're studying homosexuality in frogs, that's gonna get me in bigger trouble. <laughs> but the other reason that they have very low fertility is that even if they try, they're incapable because the testes look like this. And how many people know statistics? How many, you like p-values, right? p less than 
You know what I like even better is when you can see the difference. And you can see the difference. So these are slices of testis under the microscope, control and atrazine treated. And if I blow this up, I'm going to show you what's going on. I'll blow the other one up, these sections. These are testicular tubules full of sperm in the controls. The atrazine treated testis are void of sperm. They have some, some cellular debris, but they don't have enough testosterone to show the behavior. And even if they did, they don't have enough testosterone to maintain sperm production. So they're completely incapable. So then, and we measured a bunch of other stuff that I won't bore you with, and we published another paper in PNAS, atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration. And male African call for chemical castration. It's a grown-up word. Remember, they come in twos. The company hates the word chemical castration. That's why I put it in the title, because that's just the kind of brother I am. The other thing I'm proud of is there are nine undergraduates co-authored this paper. Every one of them now has an MD or PhD. I'm equally proud of that as I am. So now, here was where we're at in my story. Now I'm coming up for full professor. Did all the atrazine work. Company's all upset. But now I want to know, I'm thinking about the science, I want to know, do effects occur in other species of frog, or is it just something that occurs in this weird African clawed frog? So we looked at the North American leopard frog, and we showed the following. It's not a hermaphrodite, what you're looking at, because it doesn't have ovaries. What it has is a testis. See, that's a testis up top. I, I told you, you're going to see a lot of gonads today. I hope that's okay with you before lunch. So these are the testes. And then all this, you see this? I call it junk in the trunk. You know what all that stuff is back there? Those are all eggs, vitiligenic, yoked up eggs that are bursting through the surface of this male's testis. Now let me tell you another story. I sent off an email. I broke, I always say curfew, but I don't mean curfew, embargo. I broke embargo because this was, this was a, I mean, uh, uh, eventually published in Nature, another one of those magazines that my mom can't get in Barnes & Noble. And you're not supposed to share data before you publish it in Nature. It'll kick it out. But I sent the data to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and I said, look at what atrazine does to the North American leopard frog. And the EPA wrote me back, Tom Steger. I still have the email. And he said, thank you, Dr. Hayes, for this interesting information. However, we do not view this as an adverse effect that would trigger reassessment and re-regulation of the herbicide atrazine. We do not consider this an adverse effect. We do not consider this an adverse effect. We do not consider this an adverse effect. My wife tells me that there is nothing more painful in life than childbirth. And she's done it twice, so I gotta, I'm going to give her that. But I would guess, and guys, are you with me on this? I would guess that a dozen chicken eggs in my testicle would be somewhere in the top five <laughs> most painful <laughs> experiences, right? The EPA says, no, no, it's, it's fine. You can have eggs in your testes. Right. So at any rate, the reason we did the North American leopard frog is we asked, well, do these effects occur in the wild? Is this a laboratory artifact, something we got to worry about or not? And I haven't talked to you about levels yet. Let me give you some idea of levels. We produce these effects in the lab at 0.1 parts per billion. That's 0.1 micrograms per liter. That's 100 nanograms per liter. That's 100 picograms per million. That's like 10 to the negative ninth. That probably doesn't mean anything to you. But that's about one one-thousandth of a grain of salt in two liters of water. Now, here's what the package of atrazine recommends for the applicator, for the farmer. 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. That means a farmer is applying this stuff at levels that are 290 million times higher than we use in the laboratory. And what you're looking at now is a log scale. Here's the minimum and maximum detection in agriculture runoff, temporary pools, permanent water, precipitation. Here's what we're using in the lab. Here's all the environments that would be at risk. There's enough atrazine in rainwater to produce these effects. A half million pounds of atrazine come down in rainwater every year. It goes up on dust, can travel 1,000 kilometers or 600 miles. They can measure it in Minnesota from when people apply it in Kansas. The drinking water standard is 30 parts per billion, 30 times higher than we use in the lab. In fact, when I first was going to do these experiments, the, 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 we have this EHS, I'm sure you guys have it here too, Environmental Health and Safety. They wrote me an email. They said, Dr. Hayes, we're concerned about your experiments. What are you going to do with the water, the wastewater, after you're done? And I emailed back. I said, well, I'm going to take it home and drink it because it's guaranteed to have less atrazine than my. I thought it was funny. <laughs> they, 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 not so much. They're pretty serious about that stuff over there. So here's what we did. Here's what we did. We, this is now an animal from the. I told you, you're going to see a lot of gonads. So here's an animal from the wild. This is no longer in the lab. Here's the kidneys again. Here's the testis, and I'm going to show you the histology. So just imagine I'm slicing up a salami, okay? 
I'm going to fold out one slice. The color's going to be different because of the stain we use under the microscope. So I fold out that slice. I'm going to blow that up. I'm going to blow that up so you know what you're looking at. And what you're looking at here, remember these little sections of testicular tubules, except those aren't sperm in there. Those are eggs. We publish this in Nature. I call them testicular oocytes. It's a grown-up word because it's coming too. The company got upset. The lawyer wrote a letter to my university and to Nature magazine said they wanted my paper retracted because I made up a word. That's desperate. Ain't all words made up before they're a word. <laughs> Plus, I told them I went to Harvard. I can make up a word if I want to. So the bottom line is the degree got to be good for something, right? So the bottom line is we did this study. If you look at the United States, here's where most of the atrazine is used in red. You can see the gradient. We did this transect where we control for latitude, and I'm just being obnoxious. What you're looking at, the transect is, this is Highway I-80 that runs across here. And we were going to a meeting and a conference in Indiana, and we collected frogs on the way and got a nature paper. Now that, my friends, is fuel efficiency. The bottom line is we showed that everywhere we found atrazine, we found feminized frogs. And, when they're what, and it's hard to find a place without atrazine. But the reason it got published in Nature is because also we could take animals from those red dots, breed them in the lab, and raise them in clean water, and they wouldn't come out hermaphrodites. And we could take animals from the blue dots and put them in atrazine and make them hermaphrodites. So we could show in control conditions cause and effect so it wasn't just correlation. And, and that's why we, got, why we got the thing in Nature. So the next thing we tried to do, we wanted to take it a step further. This is what Nebraska looks like if you ever fly across the country. The Corn Belt. Every one of those little squares, they grow corn. And we wanted to ask, how important is atrazine in the natural environment? So we've done all those simulations in the lab and correlation. And the reason we wanted to ask that is, here's a cornfield. And in that water down there, there are northern leopard frog tadpoles growing in that water. But in addition to atrazine, they're exposed to all those herbicides in red, all the fungicides in blue, and the insecticides in purple. And every square uses a different combination of pesticides. And so we did this huge experiment, you can see now I have so many undergraduates, where we treated frogs with either each pesticide alone or in combination at two different levels to find out, and, and that's what that looks like, 3,000 frogs to find out what the combination would do. I won't tell you the long version. The short version is we published this in Environmental Health Perspectives, and we discovered that stress hormones cause immunosuppression, retarded growth, retarded development, and inhibited metamorphosis in frogs. Furthermore, we discovered that the pesticides, when you give them in combination, increase the natural stress hormones and cause these animals to have impaired growth and development. So atrazine is important, but when you mix it together, you get an even bigger effect than you might predict when you have any one of the pesticides alone. The next thing I'm going to tell you about, the last frog story I'll tell you, is not published yet. Because now we wanted to ask an even bigger question. So we went from one pesticide to mixtures of pesticides and how important are they. Now we wanted to ask how important are pesticides relative to other stressors in a tadpole's life. And we did that work in California in Salinas. And I love asking this question when I'm outside of California. How many people have eaten anything from Salinas? Raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. 85% of the country's lettuce comes out of Salinas. Garlic strawberries. I guarantee you, even if you don't eat vegetables and fruits, you've eaten something that's eaten something from Salinas. 85%. Incredible agricultural area. The river flows south to north. Red means bad. Well, except my scarf. Red means bad. So as you go south to north, you get more and more contamination because more of the farms are in the north. So we could do this really neat experiment because if you go to uh, uh, Santa Margarita, this is Monterey, somebody mentioned Monterey earlier today. This is where rich people get their water from in Monterey. There's no environmental stress, there's no pesticides, there's a dam, foot and a half, deep water, 22 degrees, happy place to be a tadpole. As you go further north in a Toscadero, there's no pesticides yet, but all the water's been drained off for agriculture. So what you're looking at now, about 3,000 tadpoles in a pool of water that's about an inch deep, that's 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Very stressful, but no pesticides. As you go further down the Salinas, foot and a half water, 22 degrees again, but 100% of that water is agricultural runoff, full of pesticides and fertilizer. So compliments of Google Earth, I can show you. We have a neat experiment where we have a control, pristine area, no pesticides, no stress. We have an environmental stress sort of control area, no pesticides yet, but extreme environmental conditions. And finally, we have the waters back in Salinas but 100% agriculture runoff contaminated with pesticides. Don't have time to tell you the whole story, but a picture's worth a thousand words. We collected tadpoles along the river, and what you're looking at 
This tadpole and this tadpole are exactly the same species, exactly the same developmental stage, same age, collected the same day, two hours apart. The only difference is the tadpole on the right from Salinas is living downstream of water that runs off of our food, living downstream of farms that have that big pellegro skull and crossbones, do not enter poison on the crops after they spray them. But somehow when it ends up in our market, somehow when it ends up on your table, it's not poisonous anymore. Salinas, here's where we collected those frogs. Now I get another opportunity to show off my fancy degree from Harvard. Because see, at Harvard, somebody mentioned Steinbeck earlier today. At Harvard, we had to do what we call core requirements. You guys might call them breath requirements. We actually had to read books that weren't about science, even if you were a science major. And Steinbeck, who wrote of mice and men, also wrote a book called East of Eden in 1952, six years before atrazine and other chemicals were introduced into agriculture. And Steinbeck wrote in East of Eden the following. He wrote, Salinas, that little place where I collected my frogs. Salinas, he wrote, was surrounded and penetrated with swamps and two filled ponds, and every pond spawned thousands of frogs. With the evening, the air was so full of their song that it was a kind of roaring silence. It was a veil, a background, and its sudden disappearance, as after a clap of thunder, was a shocking thing. It is possible if in the night the frog sounds should have stopped, everyone in Salinas would have awakened feeling that there was a great noise. In their millions, the frog song seemed to have a beat and a cadence, and perhaps it is the ear's function to do this, just as it is the eye's business to make stars twinkle. That was written in 1952. Here's what Selena sounds like now. I haven't heard a single native frog call in the seven years that I've worked there. Silent night. And the reason I love that passage is because I think it's better than a piece of scientific literature. I think it's better than if a scientist had counted frogs and reported on this. That piece of literature shows that the frog song, the sound, in their millions, was such an important part of that landscape that a literary artist devoted a half a page to talking about it in a book that had nothing to do with frogs. And now that's gone. And I'm not going to tell you that it's gone because of atrazine or it's gone because of pesticides. Some of you may know 70% of all amphibians globally are in decline. This is a purposely confusing figure that I published in a paper with my graduate students addressing the ultimate causes of amphibian decline. The biggest cause is habitat loss, for sure, no doubt. I don't think anybody will argue with that, but if you're a frog and the only place you have to breed because of habitat loss is water that's contaminated with chemicals that lower your immune function, the chemicals have a big impact. If you now have to deal with climate change and environmental stress on top of having to breed in pesticide contaminated water, introduce invasive species and new diseases to a frog that already is immune suppressed because of the chemicals there, then the chemicals are playing a critical role in that decline. What's more is, this is a tale of toads and men. The impact on environmental health is an indication of an impact on human health, on public health. I illustrate that with this slide. This is from Lake Nabugabo in Uganda. And the runoff from this crop, which I believe is arrowroot, which goes in this container is the sole source of cooking and drinking and bathing water for the nearby village. If I told the men in that village, you know, the frogs in that water that's running off of your food have no immune system and they grow eggs in their testes, the connection, the oneness between environmental health and public health would be clear. But somehow we have this sense of we're okay in our society. Here's where I live, this is Oakland. The A's or somebody play there. I live here somewhere. But my water just comes from there. But we make some assumption that there's nothing in the water because we have this fancy excuse me, environmental protection agency. We make this assumption that there's nothing bad there. I'm going to tell you that that's not the case. I call this from silent spring to silent night because in much the way, same way that Rachel Carson taught in silent spring that the death of birds, primarily due to pesticide exposure at the time, and the silent spring was a warning to us. I believe in the same way that our silent night and the loss of frogs, our modern day canary, and the role that pesticides are playing in that silent night should also be a warning to us. A colleague of mine wrote, in ecoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. 
I haven't talked to you about correlation. I've talked to you about controlled experiments. I've talked to you about more than one population, more than one species, more than one genus. I've talked to you about multiple families of frogs in my work. But the company says, I'm just some crazy guy from Berkeley and nobody else finds this problem. I'm not going to argue about the crazy guy from Berkeley. In fact, I'm quite proud of it. But it's not just me. What I'm going to show you now is it's not just more than one species and more than one population. Every vertebrate class that's been examined shows these effects of atrazine, including fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And this isn't my work. I'm one of the few scientists, academics, who brags about what I didn't do. This is what everybody else has done. I emailed everybody in the world who's worked on atrazine, and everybody who wasn't scared of me, for reasons that some of you may know, published a paper with me. 22 authors from 12 different countries published this paper. Demasculization and feminization of male gonads by atrazine, consistent effects across vertebrate classes. In this paper, I coined the word gonadotoxin. Lawyers went crazy, wrote letters to the journal, wrote letters to... You know, I read somewhere in Science Magazine, I think, another one of those magazines you can't get in Barnes & Noble, that all of language originated out of Africa. Just doing what my people's good at. <laughs> Gonadotoxins. Here's what we discovered. If you look at frogs, there's my work. Sperm in the testis on the left, give it atrazine, no sperm. This is a guy in Belgium. I didn't know who this guy was. I just wrote to him. This is a guy in Belgium. Sperm in the testis in fish, give it atrazine, no sperm. This is a couple in Argentina working with caiman. It's like a big alligator, a reptile. Sperm in the testis on, on your left, give it atrazine, no sperm in the testis. This work is done in rats. It was done in both independently in Croatia uh, uh, and in Nigeria. Sperm in the testicular tubule of a rat, mammal like us, give it atrazine, it's empty. And this work was done in Pakistan. Sperm in the testis of a bird, a quail, give it atrazine, no sperm. So it's not just frogs. This is, can't be a coincidence. This is being done in labs around the world in every vertebrate class that's been examined. What's more is, are they missing the sperm because atrazine knocks out the testosterone? And is that why you're getting the sperm? This is work that was done in England. I didn't even know this guy. Give salmon, fish, atrazine, testosterone goes down. There's my frog work. This is rat work that was done by the company. Give it that rat atrazine, testosterone goes down. So it's not just some weird thing that's happening to my weird frog in my weird lab being done by my weird students. It's happening all over the world. Now, this is also not my work. Shauna Swan showed that if you look at men in Columbia, Missouri, if you have atrazine in your urine at 0.1 parts per billion, you have a low sperm count and you can't get your wife pregnant. That's just a correlation, but imagine that. If you give atrazine to a fish, an amphibian, a reptile, a bird, or a laboratory rodent, testosterone goes down and sperm counts go down. And if you're a guy in Columbia, Missouri, with 0.1 parts per billion atrazine in your urine, the same amount that we use to chemically castrate frogs, you have a low sperm count and can't get your wife pregnant. Just a correlation. What's more is, I play with PowerPoint a lot. I'm going to knock that down, because now I want to show you what happens in California. This isn't my work. Somebody else published it. These are field worker levels of atrazine, and now I'm going to knock that down because these are the atrazine levels of men who apply atrazine, 2,400 parts per billion. Men who apply atrazine have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we know is associated with low sperm count in Columbia, Missouri. Men who apply atrazine have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we use to chemically castrate and feminize frogs in my lab. Let me put that in perspective for you. One of these guys could pee in a bucket, and I could dilute the, the atrazine in their urine 24,000 times, and I could use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. Now a little boy who likes frogs gets introduced to another grown-up word, environmental racism, environmental justice, to come in twos, because 90% of the workers who have these high levels are Latino. And we know nothing about their reproductive health. We do know that in addition to atrazine, they're exposed to chemicals like chlorpicrin. That was originally developed as a nerve gas in World War II. We do know that in addition to atrazine, they're exposed to chemicals like 2,4-D. That was a component of Agent Orange. We do know that they have life expectancies, in many cases, of 50. And many of my students who now work with me, I recruit, and I know firsthand that they and their families have been sprayed and exposed and have health conditions. That's what it takes to put food on your table. The other half of the equation is, and I'll come back to the environmental justice issue, is does atrazine turn on aromatase and make estrogen in anything other than my frogs? That estrogen you know is responsible for vitiligenesis, egg yolk production, and oogenesis. And I already showed you my frogs. 
They have testicular oocytes. This is work from USGS showing testicular oocytes in fish. They got to call them testicular oocytes now because it's published now. <laughs> and here it is in reptiles, done by a group in Canada. So it's not just my frogs. You're not going to get eggs in your testes. Mammals have like a genetic protection that won't allow that to happen. But what you do have to worry about if you're a mammal is that the fact that aromatase is involved in breast cancer and prostate cancer behind lung cancer, the number one cancers in women and men. With regards to prostate cancer, they showed in their own factory and published a paper that there's an 8.4-fold increase in prostate cancer in their workers in San Gabriel, Louisiana that make atrazine, a community that's 80% black, 80% African-American. I'll tell you why I bring that up in a second. In fact, I'll tell, you, well, I'll tell you why I bring that up in a second. With regards to breast cancer, there's a study showing with a very significant p-value, 0 0.0001, that atrazine is associated with breast cancer in women whose well water is contaminated with atrazine, and that's comparing those women to women who live in the same community but don't drink their well water. That's just a correlation. But their own studies have shown that if you take rats, as I told you, testosterone goes down when you give them atrazine. There's a concomitant increase in estrogen in rats, just like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in amphibians, just like we've shown in reptiles, just like we've shown in birds. These are laboratory rodents, mammals, like us. And the same laboratory, the manufacturer's laboratory, showed that if you give those rats atrazine, there's a significant increase in mammary tumors in those rats, and those mammary tumors are estrogen dependent. So it's just a correlation in humans, but we can reproduce this effect in controlled laboratory studies produced by the manufacturer and peer-reviewed and published. In humans, and we've done some of this work, we've published it, but this is work from the company, they showed that if you take a human cell line, an adrenal carcinoma cell line, that doesn't normally make aromatase, that doesn't normally make estrogen, you give it atrazine, it starts making estrogen. Just like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in amphibians, just like we've shown in reptiles, just like we've shown in birds, just like we've shown in laboratory rodents, human cell lines don't respond any differently. And again, this isn't my work. I went to visit them. I still think they should spell their name with an I instead of a Y, but <laughs> nobody listens to me. Yoo-hoo! I knocked on the door. They wouldn't let me in. They have a pipe coming out of their factory. It runs into the Mississippi River. 1.2 million pounds of atrazine flow in the Gulf of Mexico every year. In a community that's 80% black, 80% African American, most of which looks like this. The lawyers wrote me a letter, because I've mentioned this in my talks. And the lawyer said, I'm not joking, I keep all this stuff, you imagine. They said, they were offended that I point this out. They said, we didn't put our company in a community because it's black. We put our company in that community because it's low income, and that's where black people like to live. I said, what? <laughs> you thought what I said was bad? And he wrote this down. I mentioned the race because of the following. And I could give you similar data for Hispanics. These are the top 13 cancers you're going to get in the US. In red now, 11 of the 13 are ones you're more likely to get if you're black, if you're African American. What's more is if you look at mortality relative to Caucasians or white Americans, you're more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers. And that's control for socioeconomic status and access to health care. You're more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers if you're black. Why is that? Is there a biological difference? My colleagues who study cancer say less than 30% of cancer is genetic. So when the doctor tells you that you're more likely to get breast cancer if your aunt or your sister or somebody in your family has breast cancer, they're not telling you that it's genetic. They're telling you you've been exposed to the same crap that the rest of your family has. I got asked to give a talk once at Coleman for the Cure. They don't give me no money, but they like to hear what I have to say. I entitled my talk, An Ounce of Prevention. They didn't invite me back. But my point in that talk was, what if you find the cure? With the exception of HeLa, none of the cell lines you use come from black people or Hispanic people. What if you find the cure and it's irrelevant to the people who are more likely to get and more likely to die from the cancer? What about Coleman for prevention? Problem is there's no money in prevention. But I think that's what we need to focus on and we need to think about. Now this is a slide. Again, every now and then we do some fancy PCR or something like that. So this is a slide using quantitative PCR. And what this slide shows from one of my graduate students is it shows that if you give a breast cancer cell, atrazine, it starts making aromatase. That's what that band is. Just like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in amphibians, just like we've shown in reptiles, 
just like we showed in birds, just like we showed in laboratory rodents, just like we showed in adrenal human cell lines. But this one is a breast cancer cell line. And that's significant because of the following. Breast cancer depends on 70%, probably 100%, on estrogen. Does that make any sense when you think about it, right? Because most women get breast cancer after menopause when your estrogen levels in your blood are lower than they've ever been in your life. But whether or not you get breast cancer depends on your lifetime exposure to estrogen. It also depends on the local expression of aromatase. I asked you to remember aromatase. It turns out that the fibroblasts, the cells around the breast cancer, express aromatase, and they make estrogen, just like my frogs do, just like your ovaries do. These cells make estrogen, and that estrogen can drive these damaged cells and cause you to develop tumors. And it turns out that, in fact, that local aromatase expression is so important that right now, right now, right here, right this day, if you get breast cancer, you will most likely be treated with a chemical called letrozole. And letrozole works by knocking out aromatase, decreasing estrogen, so that even if you have a damaged cancer cell, it doesn't grow, turn into a tumor or spread. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, wow, how much sense does that make when the number one contaminant of drinking water does exactly the opposite? It turns on aromatase, it increases estrogen, it promotes breast cancer in rats, and it's associated with breast cancer in humans. I probably, and this, this, is, this, is, this is probably the closest that I've ever come to getting sued. I'm probably not the first person who's noticed that. Because it turns out Novartis Oncology offers treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer. This is from their website. What I'm telling you is that in 2000, the year 2000, because the company split up after that, the same company that gave us 80 million pounds of atrazine, which turns on aromatase and promotes breast cancer, was also selling an aromatase blocker to treat breast cancer. So if you were living in the Midwest, taking letrozole to treat your breast cancer, you were drinking a chemical made by the same company that did exactly the opposite. I published a paper called The One-Stop Shop, Chemical Causes and Cures for Breast Cancer. <laughs> they got pissed. That's why I published it. You know, that's, that's the kind of brother I am. But it's a, it's a very serious implication. So I think what's happened, and I'm going to close up here, is I think my interest as a little boy who likes frogs, my interest in this aquatic organism has taught me a lot about this aquatic organism. During the time that you're undergoing critical stages of sex differentiation, brain differentiation, neurogenesis, you're underwater. You're in the amniotic fluid. And you're using the exact same hormones as my frogs, testosterone, estrogen, thyroid hormone. You saw the structures. They're exactly the same. They're made exactly the same way. I would argue that one of my frogs trapped in a contaminated aquarium or a contaminated pond is no different than a fetus trapped in a contaminated amniotic fluid. We now know that you were, that your children will be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before they leave the womb, before they're even born. Because the placenta was designed to do a lot of things. Keeping out the 80,000 synthetic chemicals that we have invented over the last 100 years is not one of them. The best thing about atrazine is we know exactly what it does. The other ones, we have no idea. What I can tell you is that other people have shown in rats that atrazine causes prostate and mammary cancer. I didn't do that. Somebody, I'm one of, as I said, I'm one of a few scientists who brags about what I didn't do. Another study shows that atrazine causes immune failure. These are all peer-reviewed and published. I showed the same thing in frogs, but it's been shown in rats, which are mammals, like us. Another study showed that atrazine causes neural damage when rats are exposed in utero. And now what I'm going to show you are three studies that completely changed my life and how I view my role as a scientist. Not my work. The EPA peer-reviewed and published a study showing that atrazine causes abortion because of the hormone imbalance it creates in rats when they're pregnant. A second EPA laboratory peer-reviewed published and showed that if those rats that don't abort, the sons are born with prostate disease. The sons are born with the prostate of an old man. A third EPA laboratory independently published and showed that if those rats that don't abort, the daughters are born with impaired mammary development such that when they grow up, their offspring have retarded growth and development because they can't make enough milk for their pups. This had an incredible impact on me. Because see that rat on the bottom? The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to.
the rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think about my little girl, when I think about the fact that my grandchildren, your grandchildren, my grandchildren, your grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today. It makes me realize that I have a much bigger responsibility than just a little boy who likes frogs. This is a study. I didn't publish it. This is a guy who shows that if you get pregnant during peak atrazine contamination, you're more likely to have babies with birth defects. Just a correlation. But we've seen this in rats. And I'm going to apologize now for some of the images I'm going to show you, but I want you to understand what we're gambling on. This is a study, not my study. This shows that agriculture-related chemical exposure, season of conception, and risk of gastrothesis in Washington, D.C. And they concluded that maternal exposure to surface water atrazine is associated with fetal gastrothesis. I didn't know what the word means. I'm not even sure if I pronounced it right. But now I have a student who's now an MD who independently is now studying this. Gastrothesis is where the baby is born with the intestines outside of its body. Atrazine increases the likelihood of that condition. Here's another study that looks at maternal residential atrazine exposure and risk of coenal atresia. I didn't know what a coenal atresia was. I'm a little boy who likes frogs. It's when the nasal and oral cavity don't fuse and the baby's born with a hole in its face. And the one that's more interesting to me is this case control study of maternal residential atrazine exposure in male genital malformations. And I won't read you this. A picture's worth a thousand words. I'm going to show you three. If you have a baby and you're pregnant with a son, and you're exposed to atrazine. This study shows that you're more likely to have a son with hypospadias. That's what a urethra, it doesn't end all the way through this penis. You're more likely to have a baby with cryptorchidism. That's where the testicles don't descend into the scrotum. You're more likely to have a baby that has micropenis. That's where the phallus, the penis, doesn't grow. And it's more interesting to me because you know what male genital malformation, what male genital development depends on? Testosterone. And if you have a son, you're pregnant with the sun and you're exposed to a chemical that reduces testosterone, you have a baby that looks like it wasn't exposed to testosterone. These conditions also can be induced by exposure to estrogenic chemicals. And if you're exposed to atrazine, which induces estrogen, you have a baby that looks like it's been exposed to exogenous estrogen. It's just a correlation. But it's our grandchildren that we're gambling on. We have to stop, and I show this guy because he doesn't like me, he works for the manufacturer. But we have to stop assessing the toxicity of chemicals based on what they do to an adult white male. Because we know that, one, in addition to sex differences and race differences, we know that if you're exposed when you're pregnant, chemicals can have an impact, especially as endocrine disruptors, that you won't see in adults. We know that even after the baby's born, and I'm not saying you shouldn't breastfeed, but we know that these chemicals, including atrazine, can come across in the milk, and we know that a little bit of toxin to an adult is a, can be a huge amount of toxin to a young one that's growing and using the same hormones for development that my frogs use. The EPA knows about this. An article was published in New Yorker magazine about a year ago about me and my work. And the EPA said, and I find this incredible, the EPA said in that article, quote, a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives, and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. They're not saying they don't believe my data. They're not saying the science isn't out there. They're not saying atrazine doesn't do anything. They're saying a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives, and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. In a country where we believe that all people were created equal, we know that that's not the case. They may have been created equal, but they're not treated equally. I'm going to tell you a few facts about the country, the state that I live in. I call it a country because California is the fifth largest economy in the world. That means that if California were its own country, it would be the fifth richest country in the world. You know why? Not because of Hollywood, not because of tech, because of agriculture. One in ten jobs are in ag. Thirty percent of the land is in ag. We produce 350 agricultural products, and I guarantee you, as someone who grew up in South Carolina, this one's going to blow you away. Fifty percent. Half of the U.S.'s food comes from California. We use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Hispanic. 
back to that environmental justice thing again. If I block out now 10, the top 10 counties for agriculture, these are the 10 counties then that make us the fifth largest economy, the fifth richest country in the world. What do you think the 30 poorest towns are in California? So the people who make us the fifth largest economy in the world, the people who are paying that monetary value, aren't the same people who are making that money that makes us the fifth richest country in the world. It has nothing to do with food. We eat less than 2% of the corn we grow. And red, all that stuff in the middle, look at those numbers, 99%, 100%, 89%. That's all feeding cows and pigs. What's more is, if you look at what we use the corn for, who knows, who can see what's missing on that pie chart? Food! We eat less than 2% of the corn we grow. Atrazine increases corn yield by 1.2%, while 20% of the world dies of starvation. We're making ethanol. It has nothing to do with feeding the world. It has to do with people like this guy, who worked for the EPA making the decision on atrazine assessment at the same time that he was being paid by the manufacturer. Has, I love Obama. I wish I could vote for him again. But he appointed the VP of Monsanto, the head of the FDA. Can somebody say conflict of interest? And speaking of which, who's ever seen this figure? And blue now are all the seed companies that feed the world. 90% of the seed companies are owned by six chemical companies. So the GMO, my issue is not that GMO itself is bad necessarily, but 90% of GMO now is producing plants that are resistant and that require herbicides. When six chemical companies own 90% of the seed, their interest is in selling chemicals and making us addicted to those chemicals and in using more of those chemicals. I think those industries have to be decoupled. When I first got involved in this, my advisor, my PhD advisor, who was also Mary Mendonza's PhD advisor, he told me, he said, don't be an advocate. Let the science speak for itself. And I believe that for the longest time, until I saw what Syngenta said on their website, they say they assume no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect actual results. And pardon my language, but one, who says shit like that? <laughs> Certainly doesn't make me feel comfortable. But more important, the EPA in an article, I think this was published in Harper's Magazine, the EPA said about my work in 2006, the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. This is a quote. They said, the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. And you know what I thought about when I read that? I thought about my mom. The EPA is counting on my mom to have an opinion. And I'm publishing my work in a place that she can't get access to. That we in the ivory tower give each other tenure and promotions and pats on the back for things that mean nothing to 99.9% .9 of the world. And I'm being told, let the science speak for itself. But I realize now I have a much bigger responsibility, especially when the EPA is counting on my mom to have my information. So now I follow a different philosophy. And I'm going to give you quotes from two of my favorite philosophers. One who said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So not only can you be an advocate, if you have that privilege, if you've gone to fancy schools like you all are, you have a duty if you believe what this guy said. And finally, one of my other favorite philosophers said, it's time for us as a people to start making some changes. Let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. Let's change the way we treat each other. You see, the old way wasn't working. So it's up to us to do what we got to do to survive. Who knows who said that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to hearing from all of the students and spending the day with you. And it's good to be back home. I don't know if we have time for questions or comments, and I'll be around throughout the day otherwise. Yes? So the question is, if you switch to clean water, say recovery, it depends. The developmental effects are permanent. But if you take an adult and put them in atrazine, testosterone goes down. If you take the atrazine away, they return to normal. So if it's an adult, it's what, let's call, I guess, an activational effect, whereas it's more organizational. So the hermaphrodites or the females don't go back and become males again. That's a permanent effect for those. Yes? What about the uh, test you said about the milkweed in the males? Is that just to keep them from turning normal? Like no, because that only happens at, at the, so, to, so again, that only happens when they're developmentally exposed. When they're exposed as adults, it dampens the behavior. 
testosterone levels go down. And as far as I can tell, when you take the atrazine away, they return to normal. The other thing we found, and I don't have enough, enough data to publish this yet, but it seems that of the ones that are female, if you take them away from the atrazine, um, they stay female, but they seem to stop being reproductive. The behavior seems to go away, but, they, but the morphology doesn't change. Yes? Do you know if there's any work done to like, filter out atrazine and solve parts of water? I hate that question. <laughs> so uh, yes, you can filter atrazine out. Um, the, the, the reason I say I hate that question is, one, if you look at Brita filter, it actually says on the package, removes atrazine. And if I cut some deal back then, I'd probably sell more Brita filters than a Brita filter guy. But the reasons are that, um, that I say I hate the question. One is it shouldn't be our responsibility to do it. The company just lost a $105 million lawsuit where water companies sued them to put filters on so that their customers don't, don't get it. That shouldn't be their responsibility. Um, two, it doesn't solve the environmental problem because you can't you know, go filter a whole lake. Um, and the other reason is that the people who are really at risk, even if they have the information and even if they have the resources, those high levels in factory workers and farm workers are because of inhalation and dermal absorption. So it's not because they're drinking it, it's because they're breathing it in and it's going across the skin. So even if they have the filters, the people who are most at risk would still be at risk. Yes? So organics. Everyone should be clear that organic doesn't necessarily mean pesticide-free, and it can mean different things in different states. Um, but I advocate one, if you can, and I do, I, I grow, up until the drought last year, I grow all of my own food, I mean pesticide-free. But I also advocate buying local and, and buying organic produce because I think that that message is, uh, somebody put it, voting with your dollars. Um, so, and I really also advocate for... Um, supporting bills and laws to do GMO labeling so that you have a choice. And again, I don't think the GMO itself, I, don't, I haven't seen any data to convince me that GMO food is bad, but GMO is pushing us more and more and more and more into using more and more pesticides. So I think having that choice is an important way also to vote with your dollars. Um, I know in Hawaii, I think they just passed a GMO labeling law and Monsanto and a group of pesticide companies sued and got the law <laughs> taken back somehow. Like, how, how can you sue? Somebody votes for something and you can sue and they get the law taken away. So I think we really have to um, stand up for those issues. So again, but again, organic doesn't mean pesticide-free, but it's sending a message and hopefully will move us in a different direction. Yes? Um, I was wondering about, uh, do you know anything about the effect of the higher estrogen in females as far as reproduction? I have a student who actually just graduated, and, and that was one of her big interests, and, and, and we did a huge experiment to try to look at that. And I think the problem is females already have estrogen, and they already make like 2,000 eggs at a time. It's just really difficult to see if, that's a, if there's an impact. The reason I ask is there's, in humans, you know, you can get something like the polycystic yep. diseases, so I didn't know if that could have any effect. Yeah, well, and, and some people have proposed that PCOS is, is related to environmental contaminant exposure, including atrazine, but I don't know of a good model yet that shows that. And we just... I mean, other effects have been shown, like with the mammary tumors and the other effects that I showed in female mammals. But just, I think frogs are, are so estrogenic anyway and produce so, and, you know, you're trying to determine if this frog has 2,200 eggs as opposed to 2,000, and we just haven't been able, we're still working on it, but we haven't been able to find an effect on the females. I'm going to have to answer and, yes. I will. Thank you.